Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Model Driven Observability with Prometheus, Alert Manager, Grafana, and Loki. I'm actually having problems with the audio on my end. I did not hear Simon. <laughs> right. well, it's probably me. Okay, so hi, my name is Simon Aronson. I'm the engineering manager for observability here at Canonical. Uh, I've been spending most of my career trying to build reliable systems and the tools for making sure that that's the case. My name is Michele Machopi. I'm the product manager for observability at Canonical. I've been doing observability, APM monitoring for the best part of a decade by now. And I have a thing for automation. If it's not automated, I do not like it. So what are we, what are we going to do today together? Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about why observability is important. Then uh, we are going to briefly talk about Juju at a very high level. Juju is a toolkit that allows you in a very intuitive way to model, deploy, and operate software. And uh, we are going to take uh, the concept of Juju and apply them to observability through the model-driven observability concept. And then we're going to put that concept in action by showing you a demo of a charmed operator for uh, a Spring Boot application that integrates really nicely with a bunch of other charmed operators that provide monitoring capabilities, such as Loki, Prometheus, and Grafana. So before we start talking about observability, we need to talk about uh, the context of observability. And the context is that our software is hard and error prone. What we would all like is to have software that is as intuitive and reliable as a toaster. You put bread in, bread comes out a little later, nicely baked. The reality is much different. For software that is not trivial, you need a lot of tooling, a lot of expertise, and you have the occasional very hard moment of figuring out why it's broken. And uh, well, it has been getting worse because with the advent of uh, Cloud Native that brought a lot of very good things, it also brought an additional amount of complexity because of the distributed nature of microservices and the complexities of having a lot of very small programs talk with each other over many different networks, different geographical regions, and so on and so forth. And the, it changes from application to application, but um, the modularization microservices has, on average, raised the complexity of the software we need to, to operate. And that, in turn, has decreased our operational insights. It's harder to understand if the software is running well, and when it doesn't, to find out why. One of the things that uh, Cloud Native Monitoring and the emphasis on distributed systems has brought is to really emphasize the network effect of monitoring. The more you monitor different applications, different pieces of software that are supposed to interact together, the better it is. If you monitor just one database and do not know who's using it or why, you are not able, for example, to estimate what is the impact of an issue on the database whether you, you should stand up in the middle of the night to fix it, or you can wait tomorrow until the third coffee. This is uh, something that is, is very related with the nature of, uh, of distributed systems. And ultimately, you need your observability to be able to tell you how issues propagate from one component to another, usually from the dependency to the dependee, and what is the impact on the end users at the end, at the other end of your application. So from the deepest database, you should be able to know when there are issues who's impacted on the other side. The fact that you're also monitoring a lot of things together means that it's uh, ever so important to actually be able to, to correlate information across uh, time and, and space, that is the topology of your application, across many different components to find out things that are causing each other. For example, issues in the database 
spikes in latency in, in a bunch of applications, but also to be able to contextualize this information across your stack. So issues that may, might manifest at the level of your application may actually originate a few, a, a few layers beneath in your infrastructure, for example, at the orchestration or networking level. So the more you, you have telemetry, the more you do monitoring in a way that uh, puts together components and across layers, the better insights you have. This, however, comes with a cost because the more you need to monitor, the more time you spend setting up and maintaining that monitoring. This is what we call the toil of monitoring. When we talk, for example, microservices, they are supposed to, to evolve independently. And they evolve usually a lot over time. And as the software evolves, so must evolve the way you monitor it. If you start moving components around, you need to adjust, the, uh, for example, the alert rules. If you deploy new pieces of software, those need to be monitored as well. Otherwise, you, you have fundamentally blind spots in your monitoring. And all that adds up significantly in terms of the toil of your DevOps or SRE teams. So let's talk briefly about Juju, which aims at uh, fixing a lot of the operational pr problems that are underpinning the issues with, uh, with cloud-native systems and observability that we've been discussing so far. We're going to keep it very simple. There is a, a lot to learn about Juju, but this is not a webinar about Juju, it's a webinar about how to use Juju for observability. So we'll, we'll keep it high level. And we are going to start by giving you a visual language to, uh, to have a mental model of how Juju works. And the mental model is refreshingly simple. When you deploy a piece of software, that is an application. Right now, you see a, a circle representing a deployment of Prometheus from the symbol of the torch. When you want things to work together, for example, you want a Grafana deployment to be able to fetch data from Prometheus, you are creating a relation, which is this line connecting the, the two bubbles. When you deploy applications on Juju, they can work, you can deploy them on many different substrates. Juju supports uh, all the major clouds, uh, LexD, Mass. Uh, Kubernetes across all the Kubernetes is out there. So you actually can mix and match through Juju uh, pieces of software that are running on completely different infrastructures. And this is what we call a cross-model relation. So when you start having software deployed, for example, on Kubernetes on the cloud, talk with software that is deployed on bare metal in your own data center, in Juju that will end up as a cross-model relation. This is going to be important going forward because for reasons of resilience, your monitoring system, your monitoring stack should be self-contained. It should share as little infrastructure as possible with the software it is monitoring. Otherwise, when there is an issue at the level of the infrastructure, it goes down both the application and what is monitoring your application. Now, just to give you a, a brief idea of what we're also going to do in the, in the demo. How do charmed operators communicate? What happens when I tell Grafana to go and get data from, from Prometheus? It's relatively simple. When, when you say, I want those two applications to work together, um, I missed the, the Juju logo here, bugging the slides. Um, the, two, the two operators, can exchange information. For example, Prometheus will tell Grafana what is its, uh, its API, what is the URL of its API. And then the charmed operator in Grafana will set up a data source for Prometheus using that URL. And then the data source will open a socket and talk with the Prometheus API. Juju is effectively a, an entire lifecycle manager. It's more than just letting applications talk with one another. You also configure applications, although we try to keep the amount of configurations as little as possible to make Juju very idiomatic and easy to, to deploy and operate. You integrate the applications of the relations and you, you scale applications up and down. 
So for example, you can uh, you can tell Grafana to scale up uh, to scale up to, to three units and in the meanwhile, the Grafana operator can also know that Prometheus is going through an upgrade and for example, wait until some queries are executed. Juju provides primitives for all of this. Juju also supports upgrades. So uh, when you have software working with it, you know, two pieces of software working with each other, they need to be often to some extent aware of upgrades on both sides. Juju manages the upgrade of your software. You can say, go and deploy the latest version of the Prometheus operator, which uses the latest version of Prometheus. And uh, that is all managed by Juju. And through the relation, then data is updated if needs to be. As we said, Juju is running on most substrates up there. You can run on specific clouds, on uh, several computing infrastructures, on the various clouds. You can mix and match things across different deployments. You can get your software on GCP, talk to the one in AWS, talk to, to the vSphere you have in the basement. You can, uh, there is something called Jazz, Juju as a service. It's a platform that manages for you Juju across different applications, different uh, 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 substrates. You can tell Jazz to manage your AWS applications running on, on EC2, or for example, to manage stuff you have in your data center. It's very powerful. And now, how are we going to use this power to actually make observability simpler and avoid toil? Well, th that's the whole point of model-driven observability. By leveraging Juju relations, you can get to a state where it is getting your application observed is as simple as to say, Prometheus, go monitor that. That's it, right? It's very low toil because the only thing that you're doing is establishing the relation between the two applications, between your, let's say, Spring Music application and Prometheus. It's end-to-end -end automated. After the declaration, the chart operators and Juju take care of it. You do not have to manage manually uh, any configuration or Kubernetes resource or configuration file somewhere and keep track of when you update a URL or in a sentry these are my configurations that rely on that's still good. Juju is going to take care of it. It is repeatable. The moment you come up with a, with a model that you like, you actually can deploy that model multiple times on different substrates without changing a, a comma. All the dynamic part, all the, all the networking part and secrets and so on is managed by Juju. It's not part of your model. It is intuitive. You can actually, and I'm going to give an example in a couple of slides, you can describe very concisely in a graphical way what is happening with your applications. And uh, last but not least, it is contextualized. The demo that we're going to show you is using a concept that we know we, we call Juju topology. Each workload running on Juju has a, a unique uh, identity, which is made of the model name and its unique identifier in case of homonymous models the name of the Juju application and the index of the unit. The unit is fundamentally the instance. By tagging every piece of telemetry, every alert that goes through our monitoring charmed operators with the topology of the systems from which the telemetry is coming, you can make very precise dashboards and alerts to make sure that they, they provide information about precisely those workloads and not mixing, for example, different MySQL deployments. And also, what we're going to do in the future is to start using this notion of digital topology to actually mix information across different layers, not only your applications, but your infrastructure as well. For example, where is my model running? Are there issues in the infrastructure power in this model? So now is the moment of, um, of the demo. Sime, you ready? All right, so let me share my screen quickly. So 
as this is an observability product, uh, it really needs data to be able to show us something worthwhile, right? So as part of this demo, we're not going to go through the whole hassle of setting everything up or rather the lack of hassle, but we, we are going to start with a system that I'll, I, I already have that has some data in it. And when we set up a system and relate it or a charm with, uh, with the LMA stack and its components, uh, as Michele mentioned, all of the data or all of the resources we need to get started with our monitoring or our, our observability will be transferred automatically and made available to us in Grafana. So what we have here is the Spring Music application, which is a simple application that just lists a lot of albums and uh, uh, metadata about those albums. It takes that Spring Music charm and it takes all of the data from, the, from that and shows it in Grafana. We are adding um, a dashboard provided from that charm to Grafana, which you see here called Spring Music. And in that we've made some tailored graphs or tailored uh, panels that will allow us to show how the Spring Music charm is doing. So if we jump into the Spring Music dashboard, we'll see here that, okay, we can see the amount of requests per minute. And we can see that prior to us looking at this, we had some traffic for this server. Currently, there is no traffic, but we had some traffic at certain points in this, in this graph. We can also see the error rate for all the requests that have been going in. So we can see that, okay, out of all the requests that we get to, to um, Spring Music, only 7.9% were actually failing. We can also see a breakdown in a chart of the statuses of our, of our requests. We can see that, okay, we had 85.2 uh, re successful requests and 8.34 rounding error, I know, but let's go with it uh, this is from the this is based on the dashboard crafters skill rather than than an actual error so we can see here at least that uh, a graphical representation of fairly how much of the of the actual requests that were erroneous we can also see the logs and what severity they had as well as a actual list of the logs as they come into the Spring Music charm. And how hard and was to set this one up? It took a couple of commands, and that was it. So the whole point is that you, by deploying LMA, get a turnkey solution where you just take your existing charm, provide alert rules and dashboards that make sense for that exact charm, you relate it to the stack, and then you're good to go. Shall we go and look at uh, the code of the charmed operator for Spring Music? Let's see how easy it was. All the code that um, is made, uh, all the charmed operators that you're going to see in this demo, and pretty much every charmed operator out there is end to end open source. You, uh, what uh, Sima has put on screen is the source code for the Spring Music operator that uh, we have written for this demo. It is a very simple charmed operator using the operator framework to run on Kubernetes that is uh, operating the Spring Music application, which is a demo application for Spring Boot written in Java. Let's start with, um, for example, how easy it was to add the support for Prometheus. So it is as simple as, as doing three steps. One is to declare in the metadata YAML uh, that your charm will now be able to provide a metric endpoint, as in Prometheus endpoint. Then we need to import one library, that is the, the file with the load diff, it's uh, one command to import this library with Charmcraft. Charmcraft is the utility that you use to, to build and uh, uh, develop Charmed operators. And then we wire very simply the library into our Charm. It's uh, what you see on screen on line 29, we import the new library. And on line 48, we declare that now this Charm is a metrics endpoint provider that will expose 
the Spring Boot Actuator Prometheus Endpoint. And line 58 is actually saying, Dear Prometheus, every single instance of this charm, please go and scrape it on port 88. This is what uh, the wildcard colon 88 is saying. If we want to go and quickly have a look at how easy it is to actually expose a Prometheus endpoint in Spring Boot, well, it's these two files. Actually, it's only one. Uh, the, um, we are just adding the micrometer registry for Prometheus into the, the build.gradle, and then all the magic of Spring Boot does its job, and we automatically get all the metrics exposed by the Spring Boot actuator um, available to a, a Prometheus endpoint that Prometheus can scrape. It's that simple. And when, uh, when we have deployed the operator, the, the first file, the readme.md, shows you how easy it is to set it up, to say, I want my I want to consume my uh, Prometheus scrape offering. Remember, I was talking about cross-model relations. What you see there, LMA is the model where the logging stack, uh, the, the monitoring stack is, is uh, living. You say, look, I want to consume capabilities from there, specifically the fact that it will uh, scrape Prometheus endpoints. And then you create a relation between the Spring Music application, which is the one of the Spring Boot operator, and Prometheus. And then immediately after, Prometheus will scrape your application. Then there is the next step. Uh, it's uh, equally simple to add alert rules. What you see here on screen is uh, what it takes to actually get support for one uh, alert rule for Prometheus. What you see on line uh, 63 of the first file is an adjustment that is necessary because uh, we actually wanted to, to put the code of the charm in the same repository as the code of the Spring Boot application, which is a Java application using Gradle. So it has all the SRC main something structure. And we just added a little bit more structure. So the Prometheus alert rules folder, which hosts our alert rules, lives side by side as Gradle would expect with Java code. And but after that, yeah, sorry. Please go ahead. Uh, if we wanted to have more alert rules than just this simple cluster node unavailable, how would we go about that? We have more files. One rule per file, super easy to version, super easy to understand the history of single alert rules, track their versioning in the repository. It's a very refreshing experience. What you see on line two, there is a... Um, percentage, percentage, choose underscore topology, percentage, percentage token. That is a token that we're using in the, in the library for Prometheus Scrape to actually inject the label filters that say, look, could check the app metric only for this particular deployment of my application. And that is something that actually I understand, Sime, you're, you're about to make go away entirely, right? Yes, that is the thought, right? So whatever you think in terms of alerts uh, over this relation, it's kind of implied that you want the duty topology, topology to be part of it, right? So what we've done there is that we've created a tool that would automatically inject these for you as part of the transferring of the alert files over to the, uh, to the Prometheus instance. So what we, uh, currently this is in, in review, so it's not really live just yet, but we are hoping to have it with you really, really soon. The, uh, the the fact that we know that we can and should inject the choose topology, because here we're talking about alert rules that are going to embed directly in the charmed operator. These alert rules are going to apply to every single deployment of the charmed operator, and they will apply to each deployment separately. And why do you, why is this important? Because when you have multiple deployments of the same application for example, across different environments, some in production, some in tests, some in QA, you really do not want to mix the, the telemetry. You want to keep it separate and say, look, I'm evaluating the availability of my application only for productive deployments, and I'm going to ignore when the application goes down in, in QA or in, in development. And with these capabilities, it's coming out of the box. When you write your, your child operator, it's refreshingly simple to avoid any blast radius issue. 
The system will do it for you. Now, let's talk about how easy it is to add a Grafana dashboard. It is the same thing as before. We go into the metadata YAML and declare that now our, our chunk operator is capable of providing Grafana dashboards. We import the library. We wire the library. And we add the library to the charm as a file. That's it. And Michele, um, is it necessary to provide a dashboard if you, if you do this? Is that a necessary step to, to being able to monitor your chart? Well, it's very, oh, now, now we're interesting. Now we're getting into the, into the philosophy of, uh, of uh, observability. From a purely technical perspective, you can do a lot of monitoring with Prometheus alone. But uh, when you start having, when you start using different types of telemetry to monitor applications, like we're going to do in a second by mixing metrics and logs, then you usually want a single pane of glass. And uh, for in our in our monetary stack, that is Grafana. So it is very advised when you when you come up with your chart operator to provide an excellent baseline for observability, which consists of you can uh, you can fundamentally get alert rules that are meaningful, and all the telemetry to power those alert rules, whether the telemetry is metrics or logs or in the future distributed tracing and whatnot. And then to provide the, the person using the application a, um, a dashboard where they can drill down from the notifications they get on their pager into contextualized information about what is the issue, what is going on, what is the context, and ultimately information on how do you fix it. Hopefully, as the Charm author, you are likely to be a lot more knowledgeable about the possible uh, failure modes and and the different states of your your charm so providing this as part of your charm allowing them to easily hook up this into lma and being good to go is a great service to any operator that will use your charm ultimately the whole point of juju is to make operating complex software simple providing excellent observability out of the box is part of that magic definitely Okay, so now we have the alert rule, we have the Prometheus scrape support, and we have a Spring dashboard uh, in Grafana. Now let's have a look at how we integrate Loki as well. Would you mind? Would you mind uh, walking us through it? It is the same story as before. You declare now that uh, your charm uh, can let's talk to Loki. Can. There you go. It uh, it now can uh, is a client to the Loki push API. So it can open a socket towards it. Um, what you see uh, under there is a bunch of alert rules that we also declare. Th those are actually alert rules for Prometheus. So the moment you added support for Loki, we declared alert rules for Prometheus to make sure that the export of logs to Loki worked. That uh, export to Loki is done. Uh, what we did, we took the um, um, log back, lo uh, the Loki logback exporter, uh, appender, sorry, which fundamentally is a, um, is a is an extension for logback that teaches logback, the, the login library that the Spring Boot uses by default, how to package the, uh, the logs and send them over to Loki over the push API. So there are no moving parts in between like prompt tails, syslog, it's just send the data straight to Loki. Then we also had to go and uh, uh, declare uh, to configure logback. It's, uh, it's a bunch of XML, but it's uh, at the end of the day, relatively simple. What we do is uh, you see on line 17, the declaration of the appender. We want to declare that appender only when our, our Spring Boot music is related to at least one Loki, so that we can send the data there. And what you see on line 23 is the injection in the logs of the Juju topology. Loki, by the way that uh, the Loki software works, does not really know where the logs are coming from. So in this case, we annotate the, the, uh, the, the logs with the topology on the producing end. Something that we are also working on, and uh, it's going to be there in a few weeks, is actually to provide um, different ways of talking to Loki built into the uh, the libraries 
that you use to integrate with the Loki Push API. So that, for example, it would create for you fundamentally a prompt tail sidecar. You'd be able just to send the logs into there or even reading files from your containers, your operators, and prompt tail will automatically add all these annotations for you and send the data to Loki. You will just have to talk to an end, a local endpoint without needing to deal with security authentication authorization because it's inside the same Kubernetes pod and it's going to be a very, a very refreshing and simple experience. Excellent. And when we look at the code of the um, of the charmed operator, it is the same thing as well. We import a new library. We declare with a very simple line of code. Um, yeah, there we go. There we go. We declare that now uh, we want to use the Loki Push API consumer. That is a, a utility class that is managing all the all the relation and the exchange of data over the relation between the Spring Music application and Loki. So we use a charm author. Uh, you don't need to do anything anything particularly complex. And then since we want to, since we need to reconfigure the Spring application when uh, uh, the Loki is related with it, then we also listen on line uh, uh, 90 to 97 to uh, the Loki relations being established and broken. So when Loki is related or when Loki is unrelated, then we are going to reconfigure our application using uh, a specific Spring profile that then activates the additional logback configurations. And also exposing uh, the Loki push API URL on line 135 uh, through the environment so that our Spring Music application has everything it needs to send all its logs to its Marian. And yeah, that all. was really it. Um... We managed to get um, a charm uh, compatible with LMA within these four commits, basically. It was uh, it was a couple of hours of, uh, of work, including checking that the documentation was fine and, and easy to understand. And uh, most of the most of the effort was actually to to figure out how to configure logback for uh, for Spring Boot. The rest was uh, was really super super trivial. And for, for me, as the operator setting this up, it was easy as pie. I just had to had to consume a bunch of offerings and relate them to each other, and then we were done. So how does our... So the demo that we have shown you combines uh, four charmed operators, Prometheus, Grafana, Loki, and Spring Music. You find Prometheus, Loki, and Grafana on Charm Hub. Charm Hub is the, is the home of Charmed Operators. They are available there free of charge, all open source software. The Spring Music application, being a demo application, is not something that we, we pushed to Charm Hub. But uh, when you go to the repository on the bottom right, you find all the instructions to build it in local and set it up and be up and running with all the rest of the charms in, uh, in a matter of minutes. When we go and look at uh, the way that we wired it all together, we have taken, we have deployed the Spring Music application, we have deployed Prometheus, Grafana, and Loki. We have told Grafana to go and read data from Loki and Prometheus. We have told the Spring Music application to get monitored by Prometheus to push data to Loki and contribute its dashboards to Grafana. And that's it. It's all very declarative. If you find, for example, it's very easy to spot when you did not configure logging or you did not configure metrics or you did not configure dashboards or even which of the potentially many Prometheuses and Lokis and Grafanas you're using to monitor one particular application. Sometimes it's not, uh, it's not a given to know the, uh, where to find the data you're looking for. Now we have the demo. Uh, this is the recap of what we have seen. So we went from, from zero to hero in terms of monitorability of the Spring Music Charm with a handful of lines of code and a whole bunch of very reusable uh, facilities from, uh, from the Juju ecosystem. And that was it. We Can have gotten a question. Uh, and someone is asking, 
Hello both. What is your experience in using Loki? Oh, uh, do you want to take it, Simon, or should I? Uh, you, you can go ahead. That's that's totally fine. I find that uh, Loki strikes a very interesting trade-off in terms of functionality, ease of operations, and um, and complexity. In the past, and to some extent, we still do at Canonical, we use a lot of uh, fundamental elastic search systems to do logging. Uh, we have uh, full text search requirements in some cases, and whether you use direct elastic search or a gray log. But uh, those are actually systems that are, are hard to make very efficient. We want our monitoring stack uh, that we are going to officially introduce early next year to be able to work on very small devices. Uh, to the extent that uh, we are making extensive load tests to ensure that you can ingest a lot of data through Prometheus, Loki, and Grafana, Alert Manager, and everything else uh, with under 8 gigabytes or less. And uh, that is a level of efficiency that we cannot really achieve with software that is running Elasticsearch, not to a particular level of, uh, of resilience. Loki, on the other hand, uses object storage to store the logs. And uh, while the indexing capabilities are mostly limited to index by label, remember, we have those labels, we have the digital topology, and that works really well at uh, to, to restrict the amount of logs we want to search, even in large deployments. Because usually you're troubleshooting within a model, so you already scope by the model, or single applications that you troubleshoot, you restricted by model and application, and that cuts down the amount of logs significantly, so that you can still do full text search on it. So it's a it's a very nice, um, it's a very functional way of uh, taking software that is easy to operate, like Loki, using easy to operate storage like object storage. For example, Canonical has excellent object storage with Ceph which exposes an S3 compatible API and have that run pretty pretty nice at scale. And I shouldn't uh, forget either that the experience of running tools that are really made to fit well together, like Grafana, Loki, and Prometheus, that really adds something to the mix as well. Being able to annotate your graphs with log lines, for instance, and things like that to to really be able to contextualize the data that you're getting or the telemetry that you're getting. That is uh, un unbeatable. Moreover, Loki is designed to be the Prometheus for logs. And there is a very nice consistency in the way you think about data, in the way you think about alerts, even in the query languages. And that reduces the kind of cognitive overhead that you have in using the overall composite system. There is another question. Could we mix and match Juju charms with things like Helm charts or similar? So we can use vanilla case deployments but get LMA. The answer is yes. So uh, what we are doing in the new iteration of the stack, which uh, between us is going to be called canonical observability stack and no longer LMA. LMA is a moniker that we use internally, stands for logs, uh, monitoring and alerts. And we can do better than that. So comes in canonical observability stack. Uh, we're actually designing this new iteration to be capable of monitoring things that are not operated by Juju. This can be done in two ways. Uh, either you are going to use integrator charms. We have one called, for example, the Prometheus Scrape Config Target that they're going to leave in Juju and have a pointer uh, with the URL of the endpoints that you want to scrape and which kind of labels you want to set on it. So you can still create your own topology concepts if you want. Or alternatively, uh, you use uh, things like the Prometheus Remote Write capability that we're going to expose uh, very soon uh, in, uh, in the Prometheus Charm to be able to push data into it. And the data you would scrape uh, with things like Telegraph or Grafana Agent that you deploy and configure yourself, and then you send over all this data into the, the nicely packaged, very memory efficient, very easy to operate monitoring stack that we provide you.
Do we have a third question? No, it does not look like it. All right. Then this oh. was uh, super fun, and uh, thank you very much for joining us in this uh, this webinar. And if you have any questions, you can uh, reach out to us either on Twitter, and you see our Twitter handles here, or through LinkedIn. Uh, Moreover, we have um, we have a, a matter boost channel on Charm Hub. Actually, I, I failed to put this on the slide, so I'm going to do it on the fly instead. If I managed to, to convince that to go up. Yes, don't judge me in the, in the URL in the bar. Uh, let me do this. There we go. Arm up. Again, I really should have done this before. I apologize for that. And there we go. We have a, a channel called Observability. Come and join us. We are, uh, if you want to talk about the canonical observability stack or Juju or just plain observability, come hang out. We're huge geeks. And we are very eager to hear what you have to, to say about what we've been working on. We also have uh, have discourse that we use in Charm Hub for posts and is fundamentally forum. Yeah, the typing really hard. Yes, it's this course, not huh? this course. This is the place where you can discuss. Okay, so it seems like we lost Michele. Uh, and to, now he is back. Note to self do not refresh the page. <laughs> I talk when giving a <laughs> webinar, not even by mistake. So this is the place where to, you can come and discuss um, everything about Juju, Charmed Operators, uh, Observability, and it's a very nice and vibrant community. Excellent. Yeah, then that was it. Thank you so much for joining and uh, hope to see you soon again. Bye, everyone. Take care.